What I'm going to do now is to run through some of the information that has come back. Um, Tim's talked a bit about the, uh, the way the website worked and how detailed our data collection forms were. And I have to say that the amount of information that we've had has been, you know, we use the term nightmare loosely, but it has been horrific. It's the sort of thing that has at times made me feel as if I'm going demented because just small changes throughout a very, very large web, web, um, uh, spreadsheet are very, very difficult to handle. And this is the sort of stuff that we had. We had um, 184 40-page long um, Microsoft Word documents and these Excel spreadsheets which fed directly from the website had 1,500-odd fields. Uh, so they were very, very difficult to use, but great for um, extracting information if they were filled in properly. What we, we did need to do before we could use, the, use this was to go through and check them, to remove those cases which didn't meet the inclusion criteria, to reclassify some where they were submitted on the wrong forms, that they came in on an ICU form when really they should have come in on an anesthesia form, or, and some, in some cases you could see from the written report that elsewhere in the, in the spreadsheet the information supplied was wrong. So it needed a little bit because it was directly contradictory. It did need, they did need some work. But not only did we have the information that came from the website, we had the results from the, um, the meetings of the review panels. We photocopied the review panel assessment forms and that was put on yet another Excel spreadsheet. So, you know, it's been a, uh, a rapid course in, in data management for me. Now, from the forms, this is what, this is what came back. We, um, as you can see, the majority of, of cases relate to ICU admission or increased length of, of stay. Emergency surgical airway was next most common, and then brain damage and death. If you add these up, you'll realize that actually the numbers add up to more than 184. And that's because more than one of these could be used as um, an include, they could submit more than one criteria. So um, the, the, this information needed to be um, reviewed with, along with the cases in order to generate numbers of deaths, brain damage, and um, prolonged length of stay. After analysis, this is the sort of figure that we came up with for, for overall, 38 deaths, brain damage, eight, and as you can see, this has gone down by five, this has gone um, up by five, as a number of the cases who were included as brain damage subsequently died, and also, we've spotted some cases that um, died for unrelated um, causes. So there was a degree of cleaning that, that needed to go on, and the, the, we couldn't simply use the inclusion criteria when we were um, looking at, so we had to look at the final outcome. Now, I'm going to go w through some of the um, information that we got from the Excel spreadsheets, and We'll first of all look at some of the demographic data and it's quite interesting that if you're a male you stand a 50% greater chance of being included in uh, as, a, as a patient in NAP4 and this seemed to apply across the specialties. So it's more hazardous and you're more likely to have an airway problem if you're male. The age distribution was quite interesting. You can see that the younger age group is well represented, but the mo most of the patients submitted as case reports for NAP4 were actually less than 60 years of age. And you can see that this corresponds to the emergency department figures. Here we have the ICU, and these are the anesthesia reports, which outnumber most of the others. So the under fives were, uh, there was a, a bulge down here, but otherwise most um, patients were less than 60 years of age. This is a, a, an interesting finding, is that 25% of the population are described as being obese and about 60% are overweight. But of the NAP4 reports, 40 to 45% 
of all, of all about 42% of all reports came from the um, uh, were of obese patients, and um, a greater percentage in the emergency department and in the ICU. Now, we were able to look at the primary airway management plan of patients who were submitted to the, the project. And you recall from the census that the most general anesthetics in this country are given with, with a supraglottic airway device, and tracheal tubes um, come in some way behind them. But it's hardly surprising that most of the patients submitted to NAP4 airway management, the primary airway management plan was with a tracheal tube rather than a laryngeal mask airway. But um, that does suggest that these, were, uh, these cases were selected <coughs> and um, um, I think you would expect more complications from uh, tracheal tubes than laryngeal masks. We were also able to look at what was the, what was the primary airway problem and here we have anesthesia cases in green, all cases in blue, and the commonest problems were extubation problems. This is um, <coughs> uh, in all cases, aspiration of gastric contents, or, and failed tracheal intubation. And what's particularly interesting is um, we can uh, we manipulate these by putting them onto uh, the same graph, and if we look at the distribution as a percentage by specialty, you'll see that the, here we have the ICU, anesthesia, and the emergency department. The small number of ICU cases fall predominantly into the groups of tracheostomy-related and tracheal tube cases. We got a lot of information. We were able to look at where the events happened. Most of these tended to happen in the, in the uh, operating theatre, which was a little surprising. But on review of the case, it becomes apparent that we tend to anaesthetise our most difficult cases in the operating theatre. And what this group also includes is the extubation-related problems. And there's a similar sized group of about 18 patients who are in there who have problems at extubation. And another surprising source of cases in the operating room are those who required conversion of a, of a failed regional anaesthetic or uh, a regional anaesthetic that was of insufficient duration. And we saw a number of uh, complications that um, resulted from inadequate local anaesthesia or failed regional anaesthesia. Perhaps they were done in an attempt to avoid the airway problem. But, um, most complications occurred in the, um, in the operating room. It's, it's quite refreshing to see that consultants were involved in most of the anaesthesia cases, and most of the anaesthesia cases took place within normal working hours. But if you look at the distribution of cases, consultants were involved as the most senior anaesthetist for 63% of cases, but they only represent just under 49% of the workforce based on the 2007 college census. So Tim talked about the, um, the seriousness of these events. If you have a look at the distribution of deaths, brain damage, emergency, emergency surgical airway, and ICU admission, you see that ICU admission is a predominant problem in the anesthesia-related cases, whereas uh, in the ICU, death was the um, most common inclusion criterion. But although these patients, as Tim said, may come away with fairly low degrees of harm or moderate degrees of harm, as I think we see when we present you with some of the cases, these still represent major and highly significant events. These can still have often have been associated with prolonged hypoxia or even cardiac arrest, and these patients have still gone on to make a, a, a full uh, recovery. Now, using these figures, we were able to... Um, combine those with the uh, calculations, uh, with the uh, determination for the number of general anaesthetics, and uh, using that figure of 2.9 million or 2.8, uh, 2.9 million, we looked at the, the, the events, divided them, and created a, a point estimate for the, the number of major complications. And these work, this works out at about 1 in 22,000. Death is... Um, clearly less common, and if we combine death and brain damage, 
that means that resulting from a, a complication of airway management, the figure that we found was that it occurs about one in every 150,000 cases. Now, it's a point estimate and um, it, it suggests that that, that, that estimate, you could say that this is a, a sample taken in time and so therefore we, we have included a confidence interval there but for that year it could be no lower than that figure but it does really depend on our, our capture of cases and I, I, Tim has already shown this slide how the distribution varied from hospital and how some hospitals tended to uh, submit the most, uh, a, s a lot of cases came from a small number of hospitals and he's also shown this of the distribution of the event. So we came up with the idea that we may, we may have got all of the cases but we may have missed up to um, uh, in the region of one, uh, three out of four. It could be that high and still compatible with this distribution. So We've done the calculations of, we can do the calculations of incidents and look at the distribution of, of, of the cases and exactly what's been happening. But I think what is most useful about the whole process will be our review of the individual cases and of the reports. I've shown you the data which shows that surprisingly most cases are male, ASA 1 or 2, a age of less than 60 years. Most events took place in elective procedures. Most were anaesthetized by consultants. 25% of events took place at emergence or in recovery. We found that obesity was a common finding in patients submitted to NAP4. And certainly on the case review, we were struck by the number of head and neck cases, particularly those with obstructive airway lesions that um, presented problems both during anaesthesia and um, and caused problems in the ICU. Something that emerged was a cricothyroidotomy, which will be dealt with later. It's, uh, it's uh, associated with a fairly low success rate in anaesthetist's hands. And the issue of um, uh, tube placement, displacement, and mis um, misplacement shows that capnography is being misinterpreted in the ICU. In the in the anesthesia setting and not being used in others. And of course there are elements of poor management which is something that came out of the case review uh, process that when we analysed the management of cases we found that, um, that there were uh, elements of poor management were observed in the cases of death and brain damage. It's not particularly, um, it's not rocket science but um, what, will, uh, what I think is probably most important is the information that is going to come out of the analysis and presentation of the reports from the um, subspecialty areas. Thanks very much.